All right, if I could welcome everyone to today's lecture. Um, it really is an honor to introduce today's speaker uh, for the Medical Scholar Seminar Program uh, named for and in memory of Dr. Tim Johnson. Uh, the program invites speakers who are uh, clinician scientists and exploring the frontiers of medicine. Uh, and so when we were asked to suggest nominees, I could think of no better person than Dr. Brian Annex, who is a perfect example of that. Uh, Brian is the George A. Beller slash Lantheus Medical Imaging, <laughs> Distinguished Professor and Chief of Cardiovascular Medicine at the University of Virginia. Brian is on numerous editorial boards, including uh, the Journal of the American Co College of Cardiology, uh, which is the basic and translational research uh, branch of that journal. And I picked that one because, uh, to me, it exemplifies his importance to the field of cardiovascular research and medicine uh, as he offers a critical voice in linking the basic science uh, discoveries to clinical practice. Uh, the value of his perspective is seen in numerous review panels, uh, which he's been invited, uh, NIH study section on clinical and integrated cardiovascular sciences. Uh, Brian's, is, Brian's importance to our field has also been validated by numerous funding agencies as he and his lab have been extremely well funded throughout his career. He currently holds an R01 for his work on MIR-93, which we'll hear about a bit today, and peripheral artery disease, as well as an R01 with Brent French at UVA using gene therapy to target uh, uh, different aspects of peripheral artery disease as well. Uh, the funded, this funded research has led to many important insights um, regarding peripheral artery disease and, and numerous models, and have been published in top journals like Circulation and Circulation Research. Uh, and so these are just a few of the highlights from Brian's uh, incredibly impressive CV. But equally impressive, I think, is Brian as a person. Uh, I met Brian almost 10 years ago when he was a professor and director of cardiovascular medicine at Duke University. Uh, and I was just no, starting. No, no, it was not you. Uh, angiogenesis. Oh, sorry. I mean, it must be a. No, no, no. Okay, <laughs> sorry. I'll go back to your CV and. Uh... <laughs> Uh, my apologies. So, any, so again, see, he's a gracious, uh, gracious with me because as I was starting my postdoc, I went and visited his lab, uh, and he, his lab was gracious enough to help us out with the project, even though we were from UNC. Uh, <laughs> and then also from the fact uh, that um, I just found out that w that detracted from his chances in R01. So, oops, uh, sorry again about that. <laughs> well, Brian is uh, gracious, and that's also been exemplified by uh, his lab members, who were uh, highly interactive and just exceptional folks who welcomed us in. Um, and I think that was also exemplified by his voice of challenging our basic research to be guided by clinically relevant principles, of which he'll share with us today. Um, Brian is extremely busy and travels quite a bit. He was just enumerating the places he's been recently, but within those travels, he's made time to go to basic science research meetings as well. And I think that's been such a valued uh, contribution to those meetings uh, as he's in trying to improve our understanding of the cardiovascular system as well as in improve the uh, standard of care for patients. I've always been thoroughly impressed by how Brian, uh, conversant Brian is with um, the clinical and human studies, but not just that. He dives into molecular details that I, my eyes, I can't, I glaze over because they're so uh, um, complicated, but Brian has a command of them that uh, is, is really impressive uh, and is <clears throat> exemplify, exemplary to me as a basic scientist how we must uh, connect the, the basic science to the clinical data as often as we can. So with that, I'm very much looking forward to Brian's presentation, and welcome, uh, Brian. Thanks, Joe. Well, uh, thank you, John. Th that is an extremely uh, kind uh, uh, introduction. And uh, John and I do know each other for uh, a number of years, having uh, a number of uh, uh, good friends in uh, contact uh, with each other. You know, and the rivalry between Duke and UNC was really always on the basketball uh, uh, court, never really on the, uh, on the research side. So they they're were always a lot of fun uh, to, uh, to, work, to uh, uh, interact with. Um, this talk is going to be probably about 80% discovery. I actually gave a talk for the medical grand rounds probably about six months ago, and that was about 90% clinical. Uh, so I've kind of switched the uh, order of this. I did throw in enough clinical stuff so the medical students wouldn't feel like it's a waste of, uh, uh, of their time. I, I hope it's not. Uh, and but what I really want to drive is how you use the clinical problems to drive basic science questions. So I hope those will uh, come through um, uh, in the talk. I do not anticipate any conflicts of interest. I, like Joe Biden, I have a habit of going off target on conversations. So if I do any of these 
our agency, our groups that I've had um, um, either support from. I do have a company that has a lot of shares that are worth exactly zero. Uh, <laughs> we do have a licensing agreement for our provisional patent. Uh, and these are the three current R1s uh, that our lab has. Um, this is the, one of these is the gene therapy, one's the MIR-93, and this is a systems biology computational modeling one that we've actually had with about 10 years uh, with Sasha Popple. So the clinical problem I'm going to talk to you about is peripheral arterial disease. And this is defined as the presence of a stenosis or an occlusion in a vascular, major vascular bed other than the heart. The legs are the most frequent site for PAD, and for the rest of this talk, I will use PAD and lower extremity PAD uh, interchangeably. But do be aware that to some people, cerebrovascular disease, renal artery stenosis are also uh, PAD problems. Do remember, PAD is a complication of systemic atherosclerosis. Just like heart attacks, strokes, uh, that's the major problem uh, in PAD. It's good to look at the risk factors. Depends on, you could take this data any way you want. Uh, the major risk factor for PAD is age. This is a disease of aging. I'm not going to show you some of the epidemiologic data, but it's rather interesting. PAD is not going away with, uh, with aging. In fact, there's an increase in the incidence of PAD with every increase of decile of life. You could look at this and say, yeah, I've heard of this, smoking and diabetes, uh, that's just atherosclerosis. But in point of fact, smoking and diabetes account for 90% of the age-adjusted risk for PAD. So you really need to recognize that PAD is not simply atherosclerosis. There's something about the way smoking and diabetes cause blockages in the lower extremities. Um, that, that, um, that uh, caused the disease. My group works mostly on the complications once the disease uh, is present. This is a magnetic resonance angiogram of a typical patient with peripheral arterial disease. This is actually a patient we saw in the clinic, walked in. This is the MRA. This is the aorta going down the uh, left leg and the right leg. And there should be a straight line going from this blood vessel all the way down to here, from the yellow uh, arrow to the red arrow. The occlusion in patients with PAD is about this long. For anybody who does nothing but mouse work, okay, that's about nine mice from their nose to their tail lined up after each other. So keep that in mind uh, in regards to the work I'm going to talk about. Because of these blockages, uh, these patients have impaired walking. Most patients with PAD walk at two miles per hour. I'll actually challenge anybody to walk at two miles per hour. You will get trampled in the hallway. Uh, it's the major cause of ischemic amputation, 150,000 amputations in the United States alone. Patients with PAD have a marked increase in cardiovascular mortality. And market estimates place the annual sales for an effective agent at 2 to $3 billion uh, per year. At the end of the day, the problem in PAD, beyond the cardiovascular mortality, is simply that you do not get enough blood flow. And unfortunately, I will review with you the medical therapies for PAD. None of them actually affect this problem. By the way, I'm not sure any of them work, but I'll go through that uh, as well. This is a slide that quickly summarizes the treatments we have for the sister disease, coronary artery disease. We have a load of treatments. Aspirin, PY2P inhibitors, statins. We have trials that compare 20 milligrams to 40 milligrams. We have studies that compare starting it on day one versus day three. We have virtually every permutation and combination. Uh, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, beta blockers, smoking cessation, glycemic control, and we have good surrogate markers for clinical studies. We know when things work. We know when they don't. PAD is quite the opposite, actually. Uh, aspirin, you guys have been presented. I'm sure what a w one is good. A is the best level. So there's 1A evidence for aspirin, 1B evidence for clopidogrel. The problem is the only head-to-head -head study ever done between aspirin and clopidogrel in PAD 
clopidogrel actually beat aspirin. Don't ask me why. That's what the guidelines say. Okay, no role for dual antiplatelet therapies. We know a little bit about statins, all derived from coronary trials. We know about beta blockers, but all we know are they're safe. You guys probably learned uh, there's uh, alpha tone and beta tone in arteries. The idea was that if you blocked the beta, you had unopposed alpha, and therefore you would actually reduce blood flow in PAD. Probably true if you're a young rat, but not true uh, for any humans. Uh, the data on smoking cessation was published in the Australian uh, Medical Journal in 1993, not one of my uh, common reads. And the last drug approved was Solastazole, a PDE3 inhibitor. That was approved in 1999. The Red Sox have actually won the World Series three times since the last drug was approved uh, in PAD. If ever there is a need uh, to develop new drugs, this is it. So we actually thought we had this cured, and I'll show you this. This is the idea of angiogenesis. If you don't have enough blood vessels or blood flow, the idea was to grow and proliferate new blood vessels from pre-existing vascular structures, and probably growing blood vessels wasn't enough. Therapeutic angiogenesis was growing new blood vessels to treat disorders of inadequate tissue perfusion. And back in the late 1990s, we were looking at early pictures of uh, uh, human disease. Uh, by the way, this is probably a nice picture of a venous ulcer, probably not an ischemic uh, ulcer, even though it got labeled uh, in the paper as an ischemic uh, uh, ulcer. And these were open label studies from uh, the late Jeffrey Isner of patients that received plasmid DNA uh, encoding vascular endothelial growth factor. The problem is that when you then did randomized uh, control trials, you got data like this. Uh, the changes in peak walking time between patients that receive placebo, low dose or high dose of an adenovirus expressing VEGF-121 was absolutely identical across the treatment groups. And people said, oh, you know what? By the way, the first thing you do when a clinical trial fails, as you know, is you blame the patients. Uh, they did something wrong. Then you blame the trial design, and then you blame your endpoint. And everybody said, oh, you know what? We picked the wrong endpoint. Well, here was objective data. The change in ankle brachial blood pressure index was 0.00 in this group, 0.00 in this group, and 0.00 in this group. You really don't need a bot to be a biostatistician to know these three groups were absolutely identical. By the way, there was a very strong signal in this trial. Does anybody know what the original name of vascular endothelial growth factor was? Can you can. Vascular permeability? Very good. And in fact, we did cause vascular permeability. Uh, the incidence of clinically significant edema was 9%, 19%, and 28% based on whether you receive placebo, low dose, or high dose uh, of this adenovirus. And the bottom line is uh, the field of gene therapy is probably about to end. Uh, the last trial with HGF uh, actually was put on hold about four months ago, and we're about to submit an editorial that talks about last lost in translation on gene therapy for therapeutic angiogenesis and how everything uh, went wrong. So our laboratory deciding that we were not ready to quit uh, really decided we were going to take a multi-pronged uh, approach to this. And in fact, our laboratory really works on three things, and I will touch on all three of them. Uh, briefly, I'll talk about new ways to deliver agents. I'll talk about new ways to assess agents uh, in clinical trials. But by far the most fun is thinking about ways to develop new agents. So that's really what um, I will move to uh, now. So the workhorse in our laboratory is this Heinlim ischemia model. And basically what you do in a mouse is you take the area that corresponds to this area in this human, I showed you guys this MRA earlier, you ligate and excise all the blood vessels and all the connecting branches uh, from about, uh, from the superficial femoral artery down to the tibialis anterior artery. And in this model, you can look at the angiogenic response in the distal limb. 
You can look at the arteriogenic response in the thigh in a paper that we hope to get out pretty soon. We'll actually tell you arteriogenesis or uh, some parts of arteriogenesis may also be occurring uh, in smaller vessels. Uh, and then you look at the cell response or vascular, uh, so-called vascular genesis, uh, and you can look at the muscle, you can look at the muscle histology, you can look at a whole bunch of these things, and our group has published on all aspects of this. The laser Doppler B in the workhorse in the lab, uh, yellow and red are higher degrees of blood flow. After ligation, the, blood, the limb appears black, and over time, that black turns to a little bit of blue and yellow and yellow and red. And that's what you see in a young, healthy C57 black six mouse, where, where blood flow in this leg, despite doing all of this, was virtually the same uh, as the non-ischemic uh, limb. So what's our secret sauce, right? Everybody has this model. What does our lab do that's a little bit different? And that data really comes from this. So to identify novel therapeutics, we really use two things. We use a, I'm not going to, I'm going to shy away from calling this genetics because uh, John is right. We actually, because of our a collaboration with Vicki Bouch, uh, a, a grant reviewer got called out who actually gave our grant a perfect score. Uh, and we ended up getting replaced by somebody else. And so it is what it is. That's the way grants go. Uh, <laughs> I didn't tell Vicki about it until like actually two months ago. Um, and so what's the genetics part to this? Well, this, is a, this patient on the right was actually at Duke enrolled in one of our NIH trials looking at the effects of exercise training. This is actually the remains of a foot or toe. And this was a patient in a first in human gene therapy trial with a veg, zinc finger activating VEGF transcription factor. The point I want to make is these two patients were the same age, same gender, same risk factors, same ankle brachial blood pressure index. And if I showed you the arteriogram oops, of this patient versus this patient, they looked absolutely identical, OK? We sort of, without any other data behind this, said there have got to be genetic focuses uh, on this. The second thing is that as opposed to focusing on where collateral vessels grow, I won't go through the argument of it um, till the end, but we also focus on the distal muscle. OK, so how did this work out? Worked out fairly well. Uh, we began with the idea of taking C57 black six mice that respond very well to hind limb ischemia. That's the group I showed you from that workhorse laser Doppler. C57 black six mice clearly do not do as well. This is the laser Doppler uh, scan over time. Bulb C mice don't do that well. Black six mice do fairly well. Uh, you cross them and you get an F1. The F1 acts like the C57 black six. You take the F1, cross it to the bulb C. We took 105 mice done by a very talented vascular surgeon uh, in the lab. 105 mice actually done in five days. And we sent the outcome of this to gen for genome-wide linkage uh, uh, analysis, and this is what we got back. And what we showed is a single peak on the short arm of mouse chromosome 7 had a, P a LOD score of about 7.3 or about 300 million to 1 that there was a gene somewhere uh, in this area that accounted for these strain uh, differences, and that whether you used necrosis uh, or perfusion recovery. The truth is that actually it's taken us time to work through uh, some of these genes, uh, and our overnight success is probably shown about five, seven years later. And these are about four papers that actually have been produced recently using this concept uh, of the strain-based uh, outcome. So let me walk you through the first one of these, and that is the interleukin-21 receptor resides right at the peak of the gene outcome association in mice. So if I took this figure and blew it up and put the IL-21 receptor gene, it is right at this uh, peak point. By the way, it was not there in 08. The mouse sequence got redone somewhere between 
uh, 08 and 12, and the genes kind of moved around. So be careful once in a while. That can happen, okay? So what was the data? The data is shown in this paper uh, in ATVB. Black six mice upregulated the interleukin-21 receptor, pretty good number, about 40-fold. But if we isolated endothelial cells from the ischemic muscle, this fold induction was about 150-fold. If we co-stain for interleukin-21 receptor and CD31, a marker of endothelial cells, we have a huge number of merged uh, images in the C57 black six mice. When you do flow sorting of those cells, you see the overlap of the interleukin-21 receptor uh, with CD31, and in C57 black six mice, an increase in the IL-21 receptor expression on the endothelial uh, uh, cells. And if you look at the fraction of interleukin-21 percent of interleukin-21 receptor positive cells, vastly increased in the C57 black six mice. We then did two loss of function studies. One is we got access to interleukin-21 receptor knockout mice uh, from Warren Leonard at the NHLBI. They have impaired perfusion recovery. We also got access from them from an IL-21 receptor FC chimera, basically a immunoglobulin protein with an absorbance point for interleukin-21. It completely absorbs interleukin-21, takes entirely out of the system, gets you out of any issues that may exist uh, with knockout mice, because this is basically an otherwise uh, young, healthy, the same C57 uh, black six mice. We show here they have reduced uh, angiogenesis. Okay, I kept telling my postdoc I do not want to work on this. Number one, it's got the word interleukin, that means inflammation, and they're gonna see a cardiologist sending in a grant on inflammation, okay, and it's gonna be like a spam blocker on your computer. I'm gonna send it in and it's gonna get kicked back. But that's not the only problem. The other problem was here. The only paper on interleukin-21 had this title. Interleukin-21 inhibits angiogenic sprouting of endothelial cells. Now, anybody who knows me knows I like working outside the box. I don't mind pushing the envelope a little bit, but even for me, this struck me as a little odd. Uh, and this is an aortic ring assay and a matrigel assay, and in each situation, when you gave IL-21, you reduced the number of endothelial cells, tubes, branch points uh, by this therapy. Okay, so how does this work? I'm actually gonna spare you three figures of complicated in vivo and cell data, and I'm simply going to show you this cartoon uh, that summarizes all the results of those studies. Skele if those studies done that I just quoted are done under normoxia and abundant growth factor conditions. By the way, this is kind of like what happens in a tumor, right? You got a load of blood vessels, you got really, though tumors are hypoxic, you know, they're hypoxic in these little nests. They're largely able to produce, get enough blood flow. And interleukin-21 binds to the receptor and activates the STAT1 pathway. This is angiostatic. But you put the same cells under hypoxia and serum starvation, so you now reduce the amount of IL, of growth factors relative to the uh, IL-21, and instead of activating STAT-1, you actually activate STAT-3, and you get uh, increase in the survival proteins, reduction uh, in apoptosis, and that's the mechanism uh, that was in that paper. So again, showing you that you've got to be careful when you read that something is angiostatic or angiogenic, understand the context under which it was studied. Okay, by the way, if you, now our lab is getting really excited about this, and we're thinking, wow, interleukin-21 is actually being developed. Uh, this was a study of human uh, gastroc muscle, and we show that endothelium from human gastroc muscle actually upregulate the interleukin-21 receptor uh, it, it both, uh, by, both, uh, uh, by both measures. So this was all looking uh, uh, pretty good. We did a study, interleukin-21 plasmid actually is very expensive. 
Uh, so we just gave a plasmid DNA, uh, and then this myoglobin transgenic overexpressing mouse, interleukin-21 plasmid increased perfusion recovery, uh, reduced necrosis after Heinlein ischemia, actually pretty uh, markedly. And what then happened is I presented this data at a general medicine meeting, and there were several senior hematologists in the audience, and one of them raised their hand and said, excuse me, are you out of your bleeping mind <laughs> that you're gonna actually give interleukin-21 to a human? So I then started to read, and I said, yeah, maybe this is really not a good way uh, to do it. So not being, figuring we're not gonna go with the direct approach, what's our indirect approach? What we did is we again took ischemic limb muscle uh, where we inactivated uh, the receptor versus allowed the receptor to be activated, so C57 black six mice, versus those treated with the FC chimera. These have good perfusion recovery, good angiogenesis, good STAT3 activation. These have low. We sent it, uh, we looked at the genes that were differentially regulated by the FC chimera treatment in the ischemic muscle by RNA-seq. And what you see here, looking at whole muscle, we didn't do any separation here. This is the entire muscle taken out and ground up. 27% of the differentially regulated genes were actually STAT3 targets. Only one of them was actually a STAT1 target. And if we used a two-fold cutoff, we actually had 100% fidelity. Uh, for STAT3 activation over STAT1 activation uh, in vivo. And our current approach in the lab is to uh, work through these genes. I'm not, I won't carry you through it, but we've identified a downstream target uh, and have actually shown that we can recapitulate all the effects of IL-21 uh, through this one regulated gene. But this is going to also allow me to transition to microRNA, so I'll tell you two quick microRNA stories. Uh, again, for people who don't know, microRNAs are, have evolved as, uh, are known now as potent regulators of gene expression, especially in response to injury. They're 15 to 20 nucleotide non-coding RNAs. They often arise from the intron or the coding, uh, non-coding region of genes from which they regulate either that same gene, several genes within the same pathway, or unrelated genes within the pathway. So that's the general rule about how microRNAs work. There are probably more and more exceptions uh, coming out than there are rules. Uh, for anybody who does any RNA or uh, work or microRNA work, uh, remember these are not small inhibitory RNAs. Sequence homology is important, but not the major determinant of function. They are not absolute determinants. They are modulators uh, of injury, and that's why we were so, uh, found them so appealing. Humans are all modulated, right? We're not all or none in the way mice have uh, a lot of our responses. And they have potential for autocrine and paracrine effects. So the first, from that same RNA-seq data, what we found from the muscle when we lost IL-21 pathway, we lost the expression of this microRNA 30B. And in vitro, what I'm going to show you here is that the mere 30 b inhibitor blocked IL-21-mediated angiogenesis. Um, so you see here with the addition of the inhibitor, uh, you see no increase in tube length uh, and no increase in cell viability. The other proof of it is we did mere 30 b overexpression in interleukin-21 receptor knockout mice, and sure enough, 30B was able to bypass the interleukin-21 receptor and, and uh, produce an increase in perfusion recovery in this uh, model. And this work is ongoing. The other microRNA story, um, I was honored to hear you guys had, many of you read this paper, I thank you uh, uh, for that, that's very flattering. Uh, and what I'm gonna show you uh, is that our work identified microRNAs that were the most consistently different between C57 black six and bulb C mice, um, 
at baseline and following Heinlein ischemia. There's actually a lot of data in that paper, and to a non-bioinformatics person, the bottom line is we were looking for the most consistently differentially regulated microRNA, not the one with the highest fold difference. That turned out to be very lucky. Because um, the two of them that appeared are MIR-93 and MIR-106B. It turns out MIR-93 and 106B are actually part of the 13th intron of the MCM7 gene. They're actually part of a three microRNA cluster transcribed off the same promoter for 106B, 93, and 25. There is a, one of the things we do in the lab whenever we find a microRNA is we make sure that microRNA is conserved uh, evolutionarily and in particular between mice and humans because our lab would really has no interest in identifying a yeast uh, microRNA. Maybe somebody else does. It's just our approach. We immediately uh, throw them away uh, or give them to other people if, that, uh, if that's what we find. Okay, so what is the data when we actually used MIR-93? What we found is both uh, umbilical vein endothelial cells, C2C12 cells, upregulated the MIR-93 under hypoxia uh, serum uh, starvation. When you look at cell death, when you took the antagomere, even on endothelial cells that are happy in culture, you antagonize MIR-93, you get more cell death. Same thing for C2C12 cells. Uh, when you give the premier under hypoxic conditions, uh, you reduce cell death, uh, the antagomir actually increases it. Same thing in C2C12 cells. It causes, the premier causes uh, endothelial proliferation, proliferation of C2C12 cells, and it's kind of interesting in a paper that has, I don't know, six figures and 12, some six, some eight, some 10 panels. This is actually my favorite two panels. So these are UVEC under low growth conditions, and you see you get a few, when you add 5% low growth serum, you get a couple of endothelial cells forming tubes. Take the same conditions, add MIR-93, and you actually get beautiful uh, tube formation. Take cells under culture, 5% growth serum, where you form endothelial tubes, antagonize MIR-93, you block endothelial tube formation. So this microRNA is sufficient to drive vascular stability or prevent vascular stability and tube formation, even in the presence of vascular endothelial growth factor. Uh, what we then did is showed both a gain of, uh, this is um, the loss of function up here. You see improved, impaired perfusion recovery with an antagomere, uh, an increase in perfusion recovery with the premier, and proliferation of blood vessels in the premier uh, treated uh, mice. And there's some very nice data in the supplements. Uh, this antagomere was systemically delivered. We looked for changes of microRNAs that differed by one single base pair, and the effects of the microRNA were 100% specific for MIR-93. Uh, MIR okay. I don't know why my lab always ends up in this situation, but if you Googled MIR-93, Here's the paper you found. MIR-93 targets VEGFA gene and decreases expression of VEGFA, reducing diabetic nephropathy. And so once again, we have found a microRNA, and now it's telling me that it's targeting the VEGFA gene, which, again, I don't mind be pushing the envelope a little bit, but even that's a little surprising. Sure enough, what we ended up finding was that VEGFA was not targeted uh, in our system. In fact, we went through 18. We took the five, the two major microRNA, mRNA programs, took the five top genes from each program, and took eight genes from eight separate papers on MIR-93 and gene targeting. 
and not one of those 18 genes was differentially regulated uh, in our system. How did we find the genes? Because there was no way we were ever going to get this published uh, without finding what the genes were. So what we did is we found that bulb C mice, when they undergo Heimlich ischemia, upregulate 846 different pathways. It's kind of like the, micro, the bulb C mouse, when its leg gets ischemic, it goes to the kitchen and it just throws anything it can see to try to get better, okay? Black six, actually very few. And then what we did is UVEC, when, when they upregulate MIR-93 under hypoxia serum starvation, and so we antagonized when we lost MIR-93 and overlapped it where MIR-93 was not active, we overlapped these two pathways, came up with one pathway, which was the cell cycle pathway, and in the paper show that we targeted E2F1, P53, and P21 uh, as the three gene targets uh, for, MIR, uh, uh, for MIR-93. Um, we continue to work on this in human subjects. We've not found any differences in MIR-93 across age, gender, match, control, and PAD subjects. Uh, within patients, subgroups of patients with PAD, i.e. those with intermittent claudication, higher plasma MIR-93 have higher ankle brachial blood pressure indexes. I'm not sure what to make of it. I could show you a beautiful slide of that, but in reality, I am not sure it really uh, matters. This will probably not turn out to be uh, a useful biomarker. Okay, so we then proceeded, as we're starting to think about this therapeutically, we set up what is a, what I thought was a preposterously simple experiment, okay? Let's just take UVEC, which are endothelial cells. Let's take C2C12, which are a skeletal muscle cell. I probably should have said that earlier since I've shown you a bunch of figures with that data in it. Um, let's give MIR-93. Let's look under standard growth and hypoxic conditions, and let's take 18 gene targets of MIR-93. Seemed like pretty simple. Wasn't expecting this to work out perfectly, but in fact, the data looks like this. It is absolutely remarkable, the heterogeneity of responses. So let me show you what that looks like. So when anybody shows you perfect microRNA data, either they got very lucky uh, or they're just trying to look at a simple system where they can keep answering the same question or the self-fulfilling question. So, what I want to show you is probably the most consistent of the panels I can find of all our studies. Um, and I'm just going to look at UVEC under normoxia versus hypoxia serum starvation, look at the E2F1 uh, gene, and you see it's targeted under hypoxia serum starvation, targeted in C2C12, targeted in C2C12 under normoxia and hypoxia serum starvation. But what would have happened if the only thing we did in the lab was look at normoxic uh, endothelial cells. We would have concluded that, that E2F1 was not a target. And what I'm showing you here, again, is for two genes that were differentially regulated versus two genes that were not it, by the microRNA. What we then did was a chip seat analysis, so we immunoprecipitated the ribonucleotide um, protein, use the MIR-93 as the primer to sequence the gene off the pull-down, and what you see is when we saw reduced mRNA expression, you saw lower CT counts, which means more RNA actually in the ribonucleotide pro, uh, complex. And that fortunately worked for both of our examples of down-regulated genes and genes that were not differentially regulated uh, were not changed. Again, if there was less RNA around, we would have expected there to be less uh, mRNA in the complex. It goes the opposite direction. This is CT counts. Lower CT counts mean higher mRNA expression. Okay, um, what we've done now uh, is begun to take the MCM7 knockout mice they have impaired perfusion recovery following hind limb ischemia, and they have both impaired angiogenesis, that's shown here, 
and impaired arteriogenesis. And I'm not going to show you the data because it's in a manuscript that we've already submitted and have had a review on. MIR-93 alone is sufficient to rescue the perfusion defect. What this data is going to show you is whether I look at total macrophages, resident tissue resident or bone marrow derived macrophages, if I look at the M number of live cells, they're not different between the wild type and the, mere, the cluster knockout mice. If you look at markers of M1 macrophage polarization, more in the knockout mice, you look at M2 macrophage polarization, there's less uh, in the cluster knockout mice. What this data up here is going to show when you take isolated macrophages in a cell line, expose them to MIR-93, you increase the amount of arginase or a marker of M1 macrophages, use the antagomere, you block it. Uh, same thing for M2 markers. Uh, the other thing in this figure is if you took, we took conditioned media from the macrophages treated with the scrambled MIR-93, uh, and that's the amount of endothelial growth we receive. When you actually took conditioned media from the MIR-93 mimic treated, you see an increase uh, in that. And when you did the reverse experiment, when we did the reverse experiment with the antagomere, it's very clear that something from the macrophages uh, is actually promoting or reducing uh, endothelial uh, cell proliferation. All right, let me quickly move, and I know some people have interest in uh, uh, adenoviruses, and I'm going to show you what uh, the data is we have on this. Uh, by way of background, um, we have two papers that have shown that ischemia enhances the efficacy of AAV9 mediated gene expression uh, in, vi in uh, vivo. Uh, this is hind limb ischemia studies. Uh, these are heart studies. Uh, and the bottom line is in both of these, um, this created to us the potential that we could actually deliver AAV9 without having to get around intramuscular delivery. Intramuscular delivery works perfectly in a mouse, right? A mouse muscle is about the length of my nail bed, okay, versus the length of my regular muscle, which is obviously a lot bigger. And in a mouse, you use about a 27 gauge, two inch needle, and in a human, you use a 25 gauge, two inch needle, okay? There's a scale problem. And studies have actually shown that we're actually not that good about giving intramuscular delivery. So we kind of like that idea. Uh, the mechanism we believe behind this, which is the basis for that grant, uh, is AAV receptors are shown here, okay? But AAV receptors are glycoproteins. That's all they are. We never evolved to have AAV receptors. AAV figured out how to use our own proteins to get into the cells, okay? And in glycoproteins, when you have a terminal sialic acid, you will actually get a particular lectin stain. When you remove this sialic acid, you expose an N-linked galactose, uh, and that will also be appeared uh, by a different lectin stain. When you have the sialic acid at the terminal, you favor uptake by AAV1 and AAV6. And when you have um, the end galactose, you uh, preferentially uptake AAV9. That's the uh, data we've actually gone on uh, to confirm that. This is a slide I wanted to show you because it caught my attention, okay? This were random sections, and these were mice that received either an intramuscular injection of an AAV9 with a CMV, very powerful but general promoter, using the expression with the reporter being GFP. This is the result of intravenous delivery. No targeting whatsoever to the muscle. And despite that, you see histologic sections that actually look not all that much different. And we have actually dozens of these uh, done randomly. So what we've done is to go on and actually 
do is a series of studies to try to figure out whether it's the transduction or the transfection. And from these, we're showing you that if we use the chemical neurimidase, histamine is basically for general uh, increase in permeability. The bottom line here is that we can get high levels of gene expression in non-ischemic muscle by simply chemically recapitulating the removal of that sialic uh, acid. And we have studies ongoing that we're about to submit. We're able to figure out by looking at genome copy number, mRNA level, and protein level, we can figure out transduction efficiency, transfection efficiency, and the ability of our promoter to selectively uh, target that tissue. So I'm quite confident that this is going to emerge uh, down the road. Finally, I want to, we have not abandoned human work, and I want to just show a snippet uh, of this slide. Um, there is a lot, and I'm going to start actually with some mouse data. I know it's weird to create a human argument using mouse data, but bear with me for a second. So I told you about these myoglobin overexpressing mice. They, these mice have impaired angiogenesis alone. Remember I told you we can measure angiogenesis, we can measure arteriogenesis. Every good angiogenesis meeting walks away when you try to talk about humans that angiogenesis is irrelevant. All that matters is arteriogenesis and growing bigger blood vessels. Okay. These mice have only impaired angiogenesis. They have impaired perfusion recovery. They have lower capillary density. They have more cell death measured two different ways. So simply using an, a, an approach to directly block angiogenesis, we have impaired perfusion recovery after Heinlein ischemia. By the way, we followed up with another paper by Josh Meiser, who used a laser speckle direct imaging of the arteriogenic response. The arteriogenic response in these mice is identical to the wild type mice. In mice, angiogenesis alone is sufficient to drive perfusion recovery. Okay, what's the human data on this? So if we took humans and obtained muscle biopsies, we found the capillary density in the ischemic calf muscle correlated with every human functional measure PAD patients cared about. The ability to walk further for peak exercise, peak walking time, or claudication onset time. So if you have a block in the inflow vessel, if you have more blood vessels downstream, the humans actually do better. Okay, but that's a static measure. What happens when you exercise patients? Well, what you see here, exercise, I'm not doing anything to the inflow blockage, right? All I've done is I put people on a treadmill. What you see is that capillary density goes up before there is a change in peak VO2. And to whatever extent you can make this conclusion from human subjects, we concluded that angiogenesis in ischemic muscle preceded the increase in peak VO2, and in fact was the first human evidence that angiogenesis was the driving force behind exercise uh, training in PAD. There's a lot of other data in there uh, in a control group. Um, they had no change in capillary density or peak VO2, and in a supervised exercise uh, group, no change in ABI or leg blood flow. Okay. At the time this was being done, the inverse experiment was being done by the NIH. By the way, our study was about $2 million. This one was about $50 million, uh, which took patients and randomized them to stenting or exercise with a single inflow lesion. I don't know if that's really 50, but it was a big number. I think it was 25 or something like that. And the bottom line is everybody thought this was a ridiculous trial. You took a, sing a patient with an isolated single inflow lesion, you stented that lesion, those patients should have beaten the heck out of exercise training. Not only did they not beat them, they actually didn't do as well, okay? And it was only when you went out, even at 18 months, 
uh, that difference was sustained. So again, small vessels, large vessels. I'm going to make the case to you that all of our data suggests that all the changes that matter in humans matter at the micro vessel level, not actually the large vessel level. One of the many fun things at UVA is being able to partner with my new colleague, Chris Kramer, who is without a doubt one of the, work, one of the uh, experts on MR imaging and has this method for looking at calf muscle perfusion. So I don't really care how much blood flow gets to the leg. All I care about is how much does that blood flow actually get to the muscle at the microvascular level. And when you took the same patients that were in this kind of study, stented them, their ABI complete, almost completely normalizes, and there is virtually no change uh, in calf muscle perfusion. Uh, and we're testing this as the optimal endpoint uh, in two NIH studies now. Uh, this one we've completed. We're finishing the analysis now. Uh, this UH3 actually had 1,200 applications and only nine awards given uh, for this. So uh, my conclusions uh, picked from a lot of different data is a microRNAs present, present an interesting opportunity to develop as new treatment strategies for PAD. We've identified MIR-93 as a a potent uh, potential therapeutic that favorably modulates both angiogenesis and arteriogenesis. To the best of our knowledge, this is the first microRNA found that actually does both of these. Uh, we've identified MIR-30B as a downstream effector uh, in PAD with therapeutic potential, but I'm going to still leave with a sobering note. I am still not convinced any of these single approaches are going to work. I think for gene therapy to work, we need to address getting the right agent, right delivery, and utilize advanced imaging methods and potentially alternative outcomes, uh, such as the bioactivity uh, of potential reagents. So let me thank uh, Tao Wang, who did the interleukin-21 receptor work, uh, Sarovi Hazarika, who's now an assistant professor uh, in, um, uh, in cardiology. Uh, she has a uh, recently surrendered her AHA scientist development grant uh, for her new K08 uh, that was funded. VJ Danta, uh, who did all the uh, um, uh, MCM7 uh, knockout work, also got a scientist development grant funded. Uh, Ayatunde de Kuhn recently got an R01 fund, is now at University of Tennessee. I need to thank Warren Leonard at the NHLBI for help on the interleukin-21 receptor studies. Uh, Brent French on the gene transfer and uh, Zoe, who does our gene therapy studies, uh, and at that, I will stop. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. I think we have time for a couple questions. Oh. Um, so just with the